May I speak in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God. Amen. Please be seated. It was the early 90s, and Greg was a Catholic priest serving a large church in a marginalized corner of Los Angeles. His schedule was packed. Daily masses, hospital visits, time at the local prisons, premarital counseling, teaching, and as if that wasn't enough, his parish also had a parochial school, which we know from experience is a lot. And as if all of that was not enough, He'd also started a comprehensive program serving young people vulnerable to drugs and gang violence in his surrounding community. He loved his work and felt genuinely called to it, but he was also tired. Some days this diverse and meaningful and interesting portfolio was easy to manage, even fun to juggle. But on other days, it seemed like his many interests did not so much complement as directly contradict one another. On one of those days, he wondered, on those days, he sometimes wondered if he'd taken on too much and worried about whether it was really God behind all his doing or simply an over-eager ego. But God, being such a ridiculously generous God, would often use just such moments to help him continue growing into the person and the priest he had been called to be. One Sunday afternoon, as he rushed from appointment to appointment, service to service, thing to thing, he found himself scurrying around his office, trying to get ready for a baptism service, starting in seven minutes. The home visits he'd done that morning and the birthday party that had followed had all run long, and he was running late. At just that moment, As he combed through the many piles dotting his desk for the names of the children he was about to welcome into the body of Christ, Carmen, a young person who had come in and out of one of his service programs, stumbled into his office. Some of the young people Greg served were warm and wounded and easy to love. Some were even easy to like. But Carmen was tough. She was rough around the edges. He was concerned for her, but had seen her stumble over and over again, and frankly, had been frustrated by her more than most. So in she walks, high as a kite, reeking of cigarettes and beer. She'd been in and out of rehab, and clearly this last stint had not taken. Greg looked at the clock, six minutes until the service. And then he looked at Carmen, As she fell awkwardly into a worn armchair, he realized there were tears streaming down her face. I am a disgrace, she said. And he felt a little guilt about it, but this did not pierce Greg's heart as it had the first several times he'd heard her say it. The first few times she came to him saying that she was ready to get clean, ready to make a new start, ready for a different life. He looked at the clock, four minutes. He should be checking the altar book, welcoming the families, listening to the prelude. Instead, he was stuck in his office with Carmen, high, heavy-hearted, haggard at 16, lamenting the state of his overburdened life, anxious and alarmed. Three minutes. I am a disgrace, she said again. And then something in the room shifted. In an instant, he was able to see Carmen in a different light, not as a failure and a disappointment as he had so many times before and as most of the adults in her life had for many years. Instead, he saw her as a scared and sorrowful survivor. He saw her as a 16-year-old girl who had never been given a fair shot, a clean slate, a real chance, and he breathed deeply, and he knew that he would be a little late to the baptisms, and he would apologize to the families, and they would understand. But at that moment, there was no other place he needed to be than right there with Carmen. He apologized to her for his distracted state. One minute. 
He sat down and looked her square in the face. And years later, looking back on that moment with different eyes, eyes that had seen Carmen make a new start that day and stick with sobriety, he realized that, and I quote, when Carmen walked through the door, I had mistaken her for an interruption. I wonder if the unjust judge ever felt this way about the widow in the parable Jesus tells today. Perhaps he saw her as an interruption, an inconvenience, an unwelcome reminder on that tiny little divide along El Camino and Grant, holding up a sign, announcing her hunger and desperation of the incredible inequality that plagues our world, of the sadness and hunger and desperation we are all vulnerable to, of the fragility and strength of the human spirit. On first blush, today's gospel is confusing, confounding, even counterintuitive. A story supposed to be about the disciples' need to pray always and not lose heart that features an unjust judge nagged repeatedly by a local widow. This judge seems willfully unhelpful, aware of how little he fears God and lacks respect for his peers, and only grants the widow justice because he is worn down by her incessant appeals. He does right, eventually, not out of a sense of what is right, but out of his own exhaustion and annoyance. It's a difficult story to embrace when we think of the unjust judge as someone out there, over yonder, falling short of their great responsibility and duty. But it's not at all hard to enter into if we think of all the times we, too, have failed to do the right thing, to pursue the highest good, not so much because of our badness, but because we're distracted, apathetic, worn down, too busy. It's a difficult story to embrace when we think of the unjust judge as someone over there, but not at all hard to enter into when we see ourselves in him. How often have we been nagged by the disenfranchised, discouraged, devalued voices all around us, or even within us, begging for a hearing, for a moment, for just a tiny bit of attention and kindness? How often have we continued in our distraction and our distancing, even when experience shows time and time again that these very voices bring with them tremendous wisdom, even the key to our own healing and wholeness. We might be tempted to ignore such an incessant whisper, no matter how just or good or fair or right its appeal, if not for its persistence, if it didn't dog us day and night, begging us to listen, to care, to turn toward it in openness. Glennon Doyle knows something about this voice. A wildly popular blogger, she was used to receiving letters and laments and requests from her readers. One day, years ago, she received an email from a woman who ran a home for teenage homeless mothers in the Midwest, a home not for girls not unlike Carmen, actually, who was heartbroken that the night before she had had to turn away a 14-year-old girl, baby in arms, because they did not have enough funding to support her. This woman was not asking Glennon for anything. She was just sharing. But Glennon felt a powerful tug, the sort of feeling that would not let her go. It was absurd, really, something she never did, but she called the stranger and asked how much it would cost for her to take that 14-year-old in, thinking she could send a check later that day. When the surprised nonprofit director said she needed $80,000 to support each resident, Glennon said, well then, we're gonna need to come up with another plan. That is going to be a hard credit card charge to hide from my husband. <laughs> she hung up the phone with her own heavy heart, sure that she was called to do something to help, but feeling like she just had no way to meet this great need. She was despondent. It would have been easier, so much more convenient, if she could just forget about that girl altogether, if she could just put her out of her mind and pretend she didn't exist. 
if she could reassure herself that this was someone else's problem, far, far away. She hadn't been a part of that girl finding herself in such a hard spot, or of the nonprofit running low on funds. And it wasn't her responsibility to step in. It would have been easier, more convenient, for sure. But that would not have made it right. And anyway, it didn't matter. That voice was not going to leave her alone. So it tugged, and it persisted, and it nagged, like Carmen, like the widow. Until eventually, Glennon remembered that she had this whole community of readers interested in what she had to say. And she might not be able to put $80,000 on her Capital One card, but she could share the story of this girl. She could write. And then she could let what happened happen. So she called the director back, and they worked on an essay and plugged in some photos, and she figured out how to add a giving button to her blog. And then she made an important decision. People would be invited to give to support this young girl and this particular center, but they would not be able to give more than $25. It sounds crazy, but Glennon was clear. The point of this essay was not simply to raise money. It was to create a community of givers. She figured that limiting donations to a manageable number would help people decide immediately to contribute. She also wanted everyone who gave to feel like their money mattered, had really made a difference, whether or not $25 was a hardship or barely warranted a second thought. Seven hours after the essay was published, they'd raised $130,000. $130, this was a turning point for Glennon, who has since founded the nonprofit Together Rising, doing all sorts of work to, in her words, transform heartache into action, to transform that persistent voice into good and caring choices. Winston Churchill once said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. So what voice has been dogging you lately? What reminder is haunting your days? What is tugging on your heart? How are you being invited to give? Perhaps we're called to, be, to give out of our treasure today, $25 at a time or more. Perhaps we're being called to give out of our talent, like Glennon, who offered her words and her witness in order to make a difference and see some small justice come to be. Perhaps we are being called to give of our time, like Greg, who offered his ears and his presence and was gifted with the realization that the orphaned voice that would not leave him alone was not an interruption, but his very salvation. Wherever you are being called, however you are being called, listen. Turn toward that voice that won't let you go. Respond in whatever ways you can. Attend. It may be that the gift of your attention, your interest, your support is just the act of generosity God needs to turn the world around. Amen.